emperor maneuvering on the flank of the enemy fell in with Schwarzenberg's army, which was operating a new movement on the side at R.C. Sir Aub. After having fought all day against overwhelming masses, after having personally incurred the greatest dangers, and having obstinately sought after death, which refused to take him, Napoleon recrossed the Aube in the night. He arrived at saint dizier on the 23rd, where he found the Duc de Vicence Calencourt, who had returned from Châtillon, which he had left on March 20th after the rupture of the Congress. In the critical situation in which he found himself, Napoleon thought of putting into execution the project of which he had spoken to his brother in his letters of March 2nd and 4th, namely of stopping the enemy's march upon Paris by maneuvering on their rear, a movement which was to allow him to rally the garrisons of the fortresses in Alsace and Lorraine, to reorganize a formidable insurrection and thus to cut off the communications of the Allied armies before taking this resolution, which presented some chances of success and which might, if carried out, effectually save France. The emperor wished to procure certain information on the real movement affected by the enemies. With this object in view, he sent out strong reconnoitering parties to the lines of operations and established himself at Doulvon, where he spent the 25th awaiting the resolution of these conneterings. There, Napoleon was able to convince himself how well his apprehensions had been founded. Schwarzenberg and Blucher's immense forces had effected a junction. The emperor learned that new and pressing advices from the royalists had emboldened the allies and dissipated their hesitations and that their armies, taking once more to the road to Paris, which they had abandoned, were now in full march upon the capital. Having heard this news, Napoleon returned to saint dizier where he spent the night in thinking over the advantages of his plan and the disadvantage of exposing Paris, which it was his so anxious desire not to leave to the enemy. The discouragement of the leaders of his army which had reached the point of disorganization, the fear of not being seconded or of being badly seconded, the importunities of those who surrounded him, importunities which under different circumstances he would not have tolerated, the news he had of the audacity of the counter-revolutionaries and the lukewarm state of public opinion in Paris, the responsibility of the disasters with which the capital was threatened, so many considerations taken together troubled his mind. Generally so firm, a secret advice transmitted by a sure and loyal man, Count Lavalette, informing the emperor of the secret intrigues of the royalists and of their communications with the enemy, confirmed Napoleon in his resolution to return at full speed to the rescue of Paris. Before leaving saint dizier the emperor charged Monsieur de Wessenberg, the Austrian envoy in London, with a confidential letter to the Emperor of Austria. Monsieur de Wessenberg had been arrested in company with several civil and military officers belonging to the enemy by some peasants and had been brought to the imperial headquarters. Monsieur de Vitrol, charged with a secret mission by the royalists in Paris, happened to be amongst them in disguise, but was not recognized. The mission confided to Monsieur de Wessenberg remained without result. The envoy alleged that he had been prevented from reaching the Emperor of Austria, who was sequestrated at Chanceau near Dijon. A vexatious occurrence had aggravated our anxieties at the Tuileries. The Emperor had written to the Empress of his maneuver in the direction of saint dizier a maneuver the object of which was to check the enemy's march upon Paris and to force it to a retrograde movement. Unfortunately, this letter fell into the hands of the Prussians. It informed the enemy of the Emperor's plans, and after reading it, the Prussians sent it on to the Empress with every mark of respect. The Empress thought it right to keep this disturbing communication secret, but considered it full of dire forebodings. 
The vague rumors of the disgust with war which reigned in the French camp and which was said to have reached the pitch of insubordination, which came to our ears about the same time, were another car cause of alarm. Whilst the women of the Royalist Party, in the hope of a return of the ancient dynasty, were busying themselves in the most private room of their houses in making white cockades, the Empress Marie Louise and the ladies of her court, like the queens and ladies of the Middle Ages, assembled in a large drawing room in the palace, prepared lint for the wounded. A hidden fermentation reigned amongst the corporations of state. Indirect insinuations, which were soon followed by more transparent actions, produced themselves with the object of removing Napoleon from power and of inducing him to abdicate in favor of his son. A member of the Senate went so far as to sound several of his colleagues, amongst others Count Sigur, who consented to keep the matter secret on the advisability of inducing a belief in the emperor's insanity with a view to his suspension. Other intrigues had as a purpose to make use of the foreigners with a view to restoring the Bourbons. The ungrateful Duke Dalberg did not disguise this guilty hope in the very Council of State, where, as I have recorded, he had been placed in extraordinary service. Monsieur de Talleyrand concealed under the mask of his customary indolence and under a language which was full of feigned patriotism, the activity of his communications with the enemies at home and abroad. But he took good care, as he always did, not to show himself in anything and to write nothing which might compromise him. Napoleon was not in ignorance of the fact that his enemies at home and abroad were planning to make use of the Senate to proclaim Napoleon II, and that the Allies hoped to excite civil war in France by separating the emperor from his son and family. Events justify this supposition. Without thinking that the Bourbons had much chance of success, Napoleon knew that the ringleaders, except those of the Mort Fontaine Committee, who possessed but little influence, had no other object than to force him to surrender his crown to his son. King Joseph had been sounded on this point by some senators, the general lieutenantship of the empire under the emperor's minority had been offered to him. The loyalty of Napoleon's brother revolted at the thought. Disturbed by this inner danger, he desired that peace should be concluded, no matter what cost, at the end of some work which had been done at the Empress's, King Joseph and the Arch-Chancellor suggested to me that I should express his wish to the Emperor. Before taking this step, I asked to be allowed to inform him of it, for I had a presentiment that it would be very badly received by him. As a matter of fact, I received a letter from Soissons, written in Napoleon's own hand, dated March 12th at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, which began with the following words. I have received your letter. You answered rightly. I shall consider the first address presented to me to ask me for peace as an act of rebellion. Napoleon. Napoleon saw very well that if peace were still possible, nothing would be more likely to delay it than a manifestation in its favor on the part of the corporations of the state. A manifestation by which the foreigners would not fail to profit to create the belief that there was a misunderstanding between the emperor and the nation. King Joseph had never thought of making the communication which he had entrusted to the public. His choice of me proved, moreover, that it was to be quite confidential. At the same time, the emperor had gladly taken advantage of this circumstance to prevent any official application to him in this direction, in case anybody might have thought of attempting it. The presence of the scouts of the Allied army outside the gates of Paris had driven the inhabitants of the surrounding country into the metropolis, and their furniture, provisions, and livestock encumbered the various entrances. Rich families were fleeing in the direction of the Loire. A part of the population of Paris, impelled by a vague anxiety, wandered about the streets, on the squares and boulevards, or hastened in the termini of the country roads, or to the heights around the city. During the last days which preceded the 
entry of the Allies into Paris, pressed with the anxiety by which the minds of all were preyed upon. I used to go very frequently to the office of the general director of the post office to learn what news there was of the enemy's approach. The news received from French headquarters was rare and not calculated to calm the anxiety. Couriers and persons of every condition fleeing from the scene of the war used to come to the general post office to relate what they had undergone and to seek for the means of communicating with the relations and friends who had remained behind in the towns and country districts, which they had just left. I frequently met Monsieur de Burienne there, who used to come with a purpose less innocent than mine, but who disguised it under exaggerated demonstrations of zeal for the imperial government. He had every reason to go away with satisfaction, for the news was far from being reassuring. The enemy did not slacken in its onward march. The orders which the emperor had given for the defense of Paris had been for the most part carried out. The Committee of Defense had provided for matters of detail. The necessity, however, of conferring with the emperor and various obstacles over which his presence and energetic will alone could have triumphed prevented the necessary extension and perfection from being given to the various works which had been projected. Nobody ignored the fact that Napoleon, endowed with devouring activity, with a mind rich in resources and an ever-sustained power of attention, embraced in his vast genius all the details of the war at the same time as all the branches of his government, that even in the midst of the most active military operations, he found time to occupy himself with home affairs, that his orders always reached his ministers in good time, that he kept himself informed on everything, that everything was under his control, and that he thought for everybody. The result was that those who acted for him, whose prudence increased in proportion to the responsibility which weighed upon them, did not dare take any steps on their own authority and awaited his orders instead of acting. Thus, the emperor's absence in these troubled times paralyzed the zeal which his presence, on the contrary, would have stimulated in the highest degree. On March 27th, King Joseph reviewed the National Guards who were incompletely equipped and dressed, and the feeble corps of the Paris garrison made up of depots of the Imperial Guard, so scarce were arms that part of the National Guard had to be armed with the lances, which they only used with repugnance. These troops marched past the Empress, who was with the King of Rome. They were filled with the best feelings and full of ardor to defend the capital, as well as to protect Marie Louise and the young prince. The following letter addressed by the emperor to King Joseph determined the latter some days later to hurry on the departure of the empress and of her son. Reims, March 16, 1814. In conformity with the verbal instructions which I have given you and the spirit of all my letters, you must not allow the empress and the king of Rome to fall into the hands of the enemy in any case whatever. I am about to maneuver in such a manner that it may be some days before you receive any news of me. If the enemy advances upon Paris with such forces that all resistance is out of the question, send the Empress Regent, my son, the great dignitaries and ministers, the grand officers of the crown, Baron de la Bouillerie, and the treasure off in the direction of the Loire. Do not leave my son, and remember that I would rather know him at the bottom of the Seine than in the hands of the enemies of France, the fate of Astinax, prisoner to the Greeks, always seemed to me the saddest fate that history records. Your affectionate brother, Napoleon. When the court of Marshal Marmont and Marshal Mortier, reduced to very small numbers, had been driven back on Paris by import imposing forces of the enemy, and the capital was menaced when this danger had been still further aggravated by the emperor's letter to the empress falling into the hands of the enemy, King Joseph. 
considered that the case provided for by the emperor's verbal and written communications in such precise and positive terms had come into existence and he accordingly showed the letter which he had received to the empress and to cambiseras a privy council composed of the great dignitaries of the ministers and the president of the senate assembled on the evening of march 28th the emperor's letter was not at first communicated to the council to form the text of its deliberations the question whether the empress should remain in paris with her son or leave it was alone mooted the majority of the members of the council count boulet de la Myrta, amongst others were of the opinion that the empress ought not to leave that her presence would reassure the capital and would impose respect upon the invaders monsieur boulet expressed this opinion and argued with much energy in support thereof he even proposed that the empress should go to the town hall and show herself to the people of paris holding her son in her arms like another maria theresa but the resolution of remaining in Paris was contrary to the wishes expressed by the emperor and the responsibility the council risked being seriously involved if the majority of its members pronounced themselves in favor of an opposite decision. The government of the regency then produced the emperor's letter of March 16th. It put an end to all discussion and determined the departure. Only Joseph explained that it was necessary to be informed of the real strength of the enemy's army, which was following the troops of Marshals Marmont and Mortier, and offered to remain behind in Paris with the ministers of war, of the war administration, and of Marine. It was agreed that the decision of the council should be published, that the enemy's forces should be reconnoitered, and that in case they were so great that all resistance was out of the question, King Joseph and the three ministers should follow the government to the Loire. A proclamation, which was posted on the walls, appeared after the departure of the empress and of her son to temper the discouragement of the inhabitants. The minister of war questioned during the council on the number of guns, which he could dispose of in case of need, had answered that only very few were in a state of repair because the guns which were fit for use were distributed daily amongst the conscripts on their way to the army. At the end of the sitting of the council, which lasted past midnight, King Joseph and the Archchancellor followed the Empress to her rooms. I was present also after having exchanged some words on the disastrous consequences which might result from abandoning Paris. King Joseph and the Arch-Chancellor ventured to tell the Empress that she alone was in a position to decide what steps should be taken in such a grave state of affairs. The Empress answered them that they were both her forced counselors, and that she could not take it upon herself to give an order contrary to the emperor's, confirmed by the deliberations of the Privy Council without first having obtained their formal advice in a signed document. Both refused to assume the responsibility. Now that the past can be examined in cold blood, has one the right to blame this conduct? If honor and loyalty be not empty words, were Joseph and Cambaceres allowed to sacrifice the man who had given them his confidence to treat with his enemy in his absence? If they had consented to sanction Napoleon's deposition, for to obey his orders was to provoke it, they could no doubt obtain for the empress the acknowledgement of her son, King Joseph, the general lieutenantship of the empire, and the arch-chancellor, the preservation of his dignities. But at what price?